Thank you for joining our Tech Talks discussion all about women in tech. This is our first Tech Talk discussions online. We have some truly talented speakers with us who will be sharing their technical knowledge, expertise, and leadership. We would like to thank our sponsors, Cayman Tech City, who have partnered with Digital Cayman to make this all happen. If you haven't already, visit digitalcayman.com and become a member. Tech moves fast, so without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to our moderator, Alexandra Simonova. Thanks, Caitlin, and hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion. I'm really honored to be able to help and moderate today. So our uh, discussion will be around women in technology, and I'm joined in the panel today by three wonderful women, Daria Kaweka, Lynn Guyan, and Pauli Pickering, that uh, we will go through the round of introduction very shortly, and I can just quickly start. Uh, my name is Alexandra Simonova. I'm director uh, in the Deloitte Cayman Islands practice. I have over um, 16 years of experience in IT and uh, have been in IT management for 13 years of those and about 10 years here with Deloitte. I've started as a software engineer and at the moment focusing on our, our practice of technology and digital risk as well as the cyber risk leading cyber practice for the Caribbean region. With that, I will pass it over to Daria to introduce herself. So my name is Daria and uh, I work as a senior software engineer for Maples. Um, I've worked for them for about four years. I've been in software engineering for over 15 years um, <laughs> and been in Cayman for nine years. Everyone, my name is Lynn. Um, I work as a senior business intelligence analyst at Edpoi Technology. I also um, um, in the data science field. Um, I've been in data science and business intelligence for over 14 years. Um, I, I start as a um, data mining analyst, more or less, and then the, as the te technology evolved and the computer now that was able to do, uh, you know, expensive computing to do machine learning and uh, deep learning. So that's for uh, into my passion, and uh, here I am. <laughs> and and I've been in Cayman for a year. Yeah. <laughs> now over to Polly. Polly, you you have been here probably the most of us all. Yes, yes. I I definitely have the 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 legacy. I've been in Cayman for almost twenty five years, and I've been in. Um, IT services and security, uh, starting in continuity originally uh, back in, I think, 1996. But before that, I was actually in mechanical engineering. So I then switched gears into computer engineering, computer sciences, and I've been working in mostly disaster recovery, continuity, cybersecurity, and with a focus on uh, email and gateway securities. So I'm the Managing Director of eShore, and I'm very pleased and privileged to be with such a lovely group of ladies virtually today. And I think this is a fantastic topic, so thank you for having me. Daria, we'll start with you. If you can just share a bit about what your normal day looks like. What would you be working on? What would be the challenges and like the best part of the day for you? Since we've gone um, off, you know, from work, uh, there's been a lot more work and a lot more emergencies. So my days have been a lot more intense than normal. Um, but normally uh, I work on uh, Maple's main entity management system uh, with a team that's co-located here and in Leeds. Um, so we pick up tasks, we code most of the day, and that's pretty much it. Lots of meetings as well. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite part of the day? Uh, the actual coding. So actually being able to solve problems, the actual work itself. Um, yeah, is my favorite part by far. Lynn, what about you? What do you enjoy the most during the day? And how does your typical day look like? 
Uh, well, just like uh, Daria, I coding a lot in C sharp, Selenium, SQL, Python. Um, so seeing you know, working from home, we're talking about Google, Bing, Yahoo, the way people search, uh, the way they. Uh, looking for a different product has been changed. So I've been working a lot with Bird. It's a deep, um, is a natural language processing that created by um, by Google. So if I have billion of search every day, I run my Bird model to train and classify the text. Um, I know what my customer are looking. For the major, majority of the market, what are they looking for? On and based on their demand, we put together a product that can facilitate um, the user to look for what they need. And Polly, I don't know if there is a typical day for you. I know you've been, you have. Yeah, so no, I wish you <laughs> Every day seems to be a little different. Uh, we were joking, it seems to be like Groundhog Day. Every day seems to be starting about the same. A uh, lot of virtual meetings, a lot of client interaction. I think we're finding a lot more folks, funny enough, using the phone to call people, and we're trying to enable a lot of our customers all around the world. So I think for us, for me, the biggest challenge is probably the time zones. And so that's been a little tricky with the the different groups all over the world calling at different hours of the day. But I think the most fun has been just connecting with clients on a different level, different people and customers who you don't normally interact with. And I think it's been it's been great to end each day realizing, like you, you've kind of helped people with what threats are out there and how you can get them through some of the the danger zones that we're all facing right now. So I think Probably the best part is realizing that every day you can make a bit of a difference. Every day is a little different, but yeah, it's been it's been challenging. But I think a lot of us really rise to the occasion, and I think women in general we tend to handle stress a little better. So let's hope that that carries on a little longer. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think from the resilience component of technology, it's. But it's really great to see women here because I think we are mentally prepared to to handle all of that. And Polly, you mentioned that you started as the mechanical engineer. So mm -hmm. uh, how did you decide to go into the computers and technology? Well, I think it was a natural progression because I was working in industries that were advancing in robotics and just systems advancing and companies looked around to find who really had the background and engineers were typically taking computer sciences as secondary courses and I was also doing some programming and so it was really just a matter of who would be the best super users and then administrators so it was a national natural progression for me and and I loved it because it was actually the side of the businesses that I worked in that I liked the most which was fixing things and and finding a way to tie systems together so um, yeah, they also weren't building many cars down in the Caribbean, so I had to move from mechanical engineering to computer engineering, and I prefer this location better, so. Great. Lynn, what about you? Have you always known that you wanted to be in technology and in programming? No, I didn't know at first. Um, I, I graduated in mathematics and statistics, so I'm working as a um, uh, you know, a data analyst to begin with. So, of course, that we start to work with Excel, and then I needed VBA to automate my program, and then I deal with larger data uh, data set. So, I need SQL Server, and eventually, SQL Server is easy enough. But we have to go into big data, cloud infrastructure, um, and then also for computing. Um, so, about 10 or, tw or 12 years ago, the com computer chip is not tr uh, is not powerful enough to do, um, you know, if, if I have a, mi a million column of data set, like the computer is not strong enough to handle that type of, um, of data set. So, uh, you know, within the past three years, four years, the technology has been like very advanced. You heard a lot about uh, machine learning, deep learning, a, lo a lot of training model for, um, Artificial intelligence has been published for free. So because of those technology, I was able to get in machine learning and I was able to um, do the forecast and prediction, um, you know, for, for our financial system using 
Tensor, TensorFlow from, from Google, PyTorch from Facebook. It's all of, open source. It all free, um, and and we can like as a data scientist, we can access to Jupyter Notebook for free or a GPU GTU uh, processor from Google. So all all the sources are open source. It's not expensive. Um, so it give a chance to to mathematician or you know data scientists like me to experiment and try all the best model in the market and to we find what what if what fit our company the best. So yeah, that's how I, I guess I should follow my passion and that's where it's led me here today. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's quite interesting to hear that because I, uh, I was starting software engineering, but uh, they wouldn't allow us to even start software engineering parts before we complete several years of mathematics courses, as in the put software engineer to mathematics faculty. So we had to have three years of mathematical analysis and and all the like mathematics and quantum mechanics first before we could start doing like more more practical programming and stuff. And I guess all the time, I so really appreciate that background the foundation that that you uh, learn that way it's really interesting uh daria what about you how did you decide to go into the field um so quite a bit differently than the other two ladies uh so i had i had gone to an art school for you for um high school and wasn't i enjoyed math but i didn't really enjoy school so lots of skipping school lots of just really did did not like school so then um, I took a year off in between high school and university, or no, I actually wasn't even planning on going to university. I just took a year away and did lots of traveling. And then actually when I was away, my mom decided that I was going to go to university and she, <laughs> she basically filled out my paperwork for me. And when I came back, she's like, you are going to university. So fine. So I went to university. And I was in agriculture because that was the only thing I could get into at the time. And this was in um, Alberta. And then I was picking my classes because my mom picked all my classes for my first semester. And I was picking my classes for the second semester. And I'm like, ooh, computing science. Like, you know, I think this, these computers are taking off and I should learn how to type. <laughs> <laughs> and so, know, it's ridiculous. And so then I'm like, okay, so I took the class and I also took psychology because I thought I was going to go into that and absolutely hated psychology because it was just a bunch of memorization. And in Computing Science 101, like we started with um, Turbo Pascal programming and then just like just logic, logic, little logic puzzles, those kinds of things. And I absolutely fell in love with it. I had no idea what I was actually doing. Like, I didn't realize that I was programming in Turbo Pascal until probably until I went into, you know, the next level. Um, but I just thought it was like, okay, I write these commands and the computer does what I want. So, and then the logic puzzles themselves were just so nice. Like I always loved logic puzzles. So that was awesome. And then I just continued in the program. Um, it was ridiculously challenging <laughs> coming from a background of absolutely no technology. Um, and I did get, you know, I may have gotten put down a few times um, by like the TAs and stuff. And, and so it was, it was a little rough, but, you know, persevered through that program and also realized that the people that were in there, um, there's there was a lot of um, guys who looked really smart and they would raise their hands a lot and answer, you know, every single question. And I always felt so like, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And then tests would come around and the results would come around and I would peek over everyone's shoulders to see, you know, how am I doing compared to them? And I was doing awesome. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. So, yeah, so that's, that's how I got into it. And then just some lucky supportive people along the way that got me into web development. Um, so it's, but it's full stack development. I don't do style sheets or, or anything like that. It's, um, it's the full stack development. And, and yeah, that's how. And uh, Lynn, uh, what about yourself? What uh, technologies that you currently use uh, you like the most and which technologies do you look forward to? Um, well, right now I use a lot of uh, Python, TensorFlow, like Google product. Um, so, uh, so I deal a lot with machine learning and deep learning. So I have like a bunch of data set 
what is the insight in that data set? How can I pull out intelligence out of it? Um, so now we are on the online marketing business. How can I donate, dominate this, uh, you know, SEO market? So um, I also use C Sharp and Selenium to see who are there on the market, who have the, the, you know, the most market share. What can I do to dominate that market? So challenges come every day. But eventually, what I would like to do in the future is to, um, well, I see a lot of machine learning is applying in healthcare. So, for example, if they, they do an MRI scan on the brain, then they can uh, detect the certain pattern in, in the scan or the x ray and to uh, enable to detect what are the probability that this person had a disease, et cetera. And, you know, imagine if we can do that on the scan of the COVID-19, and we was able to tell right away that, oh, by on the cell part, and this person had COVID-19 or at the beginning stage, um, you know, or, 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 or at the ending stage. So again, use data science to automate and find out what we need. Um, that is, it is for me, is, is fascinating. Um, a lot of company or a lot of on online schooling is also apply artificial intelligence into uh, their, their education system to um, to customize um, each of, of the student on like you know we, like nobody learn learn the same way so. Uh, if I was able to use data science to customize and adapt to the learning pattern of different students, that that is something very interesting, uh, and that is what I I would like to contribute in the future as well. Yeah, sounds really exciting, and as I said, especially dealing with pandemic like that, you know, compared to the previous pandemics when technology was very different and communication technology was very different and overall capabilities. It's, in, it's really interesting to see how that all going to change now and also what technologies it would propel into the future. And Polly, what about yourself? Because you work with a number of different technologies for both resiliency and security. And what is, yeah. if you have a favorite, I was going to say, it's uh, what, hard to pick a favorite, about? you know? <laughs> it's like having 31 flavors of ice cream. Um, they're all exciting. They're all evolving. I think the things that I like the most are things that are actually revolutionary instead of evolutionary. So I find artificial intelligence is a revolution in technology. And I mean, going very sort of out there, looking at articles and seeing things where AI is actually working in microbiology and people are training bacteria and keeping an eye on where it's going to go into biosciences. That's that's the really fun stuff that hopefully our next generation will get to play with. In today's generation and what we're doing, I think the thing I find the most amazing is AI being tied in today's system. So from a, like a cybersecurity standpoint, the solutions that we have today can't really predict and they can't zero in on any kind of zero day attacks. And I, I do feel like we're all kind of living on borrowed time. And the fact that there is this malware as a service and there's this very deep belly undercurrent of a dark web economy that is really rising up, I think that that a reliance that we have on IT and legacy staff and traditional ways of doing things with uh, software or antivirus, it, it's just very costly and it's not going to be fast enough to get to the root of the problem. So I think artificial intelligence and some of the next generation endpoint detection response tying into systems for attacks on zero day are probably, yeah, the AI advancements is where I like to think we have our greatest hope. So that would be my favorite flavor of the day. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's almost like cyber war. It's where advancing the technology, but at the same time, cyber criminals using those advancement technology. And you see the same as AI. We are using AI to combat them, but now they have access to AI as well. So they're using it for, for attacks. So it's like catching up on both sides. <laughs> Quite fascinating story. And uh, Paul, switching gears a bit and talking about uh, you and uh, your career, what um, what achievements in your career are you the most proud of? And on the other side, what challenges did you have in your career being a woman in technology? And uh, if you felt any gender differences, both as advantage or disadvantage? 
Well, I think uh, the first part of the question, you know, I'm very pleased locally that uh, my company got to be sort of the Chamber of Commerce Business of the Year, Business Excellence, and being a product, thank you, but being a all-woman company, you know, we have a few guys who come in and out of the business, but we are typically uh, a women-led business. So I think that was probably the, in recent days, you know, there's been a lot of really great times and my, my team spans years and a lot of different great people, but I think that locally being recognized and being able to then mentor other uh, young ladies, whether it's uh, business professional women, young women, or uh, the Digital Cayman initiatives trying to get computers for kids who don't have them who are, are trying to be schooled properly. So I think that's where you get the best feedback is when you can really see things making a difference. Um, the second part of the question, you know, the challenges? Well, I think it's in every industry. I think women actually have an advantage in technology because of our, like you said, resilience. There's a, a bit more of a, uh, I think, a calm level of being able to handle crisis management. And I think that is our strength. Uh, the challenges I felt are the same through any gender uh, inequality issues where I've been in the same position in the past doing the same job and yet men are being paid uh, a higher salary. So I think that's the biggest challenge globally we have to really attack is some of the inequality of uh, the industry. How to do that, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure I, I'll be digging my heels in and trying to help out everywhere I can. <laughs> Thank you, Polly. Um, Daria, what is your take on that? What do you see as uh, key achievements and also if you had any challenges being a woman in technology. Um, sorry, what was the what was the first part? First is the bright part of the achievement, oh, and the second is the, the you had any challenges coming with it. <laughs> um, I mean, I've I've held I've been a software engineer, and that's been my role for pretty much my entire career. So. Um, you know, while I've held some leadership positions and I don't know how to exactly say that, but, you know, while I've had some leadership positions, I don't have the same, I feel like, accomplishments as probably the other two ladies do. Um, my, you know, bright parts of the career are when I can, when I can just solve problems. My very first experience in web development was still when I was doing university, university, and a professor took me under his wings. He had a company um, running out of the university, and I worked for the Sexual Assault Centers of Alberta, just creating a form for them to collect information. And then I, I got to go around with um, the director of the Sexual Assault Centers of Alberta to train all the ladies. And I just don't think it would have been the same feel if I had been one of the guys from from the department, um, it was it was very interesting. The women are very open and just could get really a, a good feel of what they needed and to be able to solve, you know, to help them do their jobs. Basically, it was a very interesting and challenging thing, both technically and also just emotionally. Here, like you know, you're you're doing a form collection for sexual assaults. It's a little, you know, things you don't really want to think about all the time. <laughs> Um, as for challenges through my career, I think I've experienced them all, um, you know, from early on sexual harassment and that, that one was a funny one where you think it's like never going to be ha happening to you. And then you're like, do, do I really want to be that woman? Do I really want to be that one that's going to bring this up and say something about this, you know, to the higher ups. But then I thought about you know, okay, well, what about all the people that come after me that this particular person is going to be dealing with? Like, this is super early. So for those, I should say something just so this guy, you know, gets something, yeah. <laughs> you know, some kind of talking to before he is actually in a, in a true position of power. Um, so, so those kinds of things. I mean, most of the time it's just people look at me and don't think that I'm in IT. <laughs> So, you know, trying to trying to convince them that I that I belong uh, is is a challenge as well. The luckily, I think with the pay situation, I've been I've been fairly lucky. 
I try to gather as much information as possible early on to ensure that I am paid the same. Um, it's, it's just been a goal of mine throughout. There has been times in my career where I've been paid a lot less, but you almost could have excused it. Oh, okay. Well, you, you know, you were junior at the time or, or whatever it was, it wasn't necessarily because I was a woman. Um, but yeah, I don't think that has happened since and hopefully doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's it for my, for my challenges, a fair amount. Thanks, Daria. And, uh, as Paul briefly mentioned, uh, um, we're both part of the Business Professional Women Club, for instance, in the Cayman Islands, and so supporting Crisis Center and looking at uh, the ways to help women in those difficult situations is really, it's, it's, it's tough, but it seems like a, there has been progress overall globally, but there's still a lot of work to do on that, on that front. Thanks a lot for sharing your story. And Lynn, over to you. Uh, have you faced any challenges as uh, being a woman in technology? And at the same time, did you feel any advantages of being a woman in technology? Uh, well, of course, just like Daria, I, I face sexual harassment and I have to stand up for myself, even though, and I don't like to play victim. I, I chose to be a fighter because whoever come after me, I don't want them to experience whatever that I I've gone through. Um, so yes, um, I stand up for myself. I don't, you know, scare of people with power and authority over me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so being in IT, a lot of men look at me like, oh, you know, like they, they judge me based on my look and my, um, like not my intellectual, but rather my look. So I have to push it really, really hard. And um, I, I, I invest a lot in my career. I invest like 10 to 15% of my salary into coaching, mentoring, uh, taking class from university. So my teacher are uh, from, you know, engineer from, so, uh, from Google DeepMind, um, lead machine learning from Huawei, all the top uh, leader from uh, Mikio University. So when I was in Montreal, I had my own uh, incorporation. I was working as a cons IT consultant for PSP Investment, which is, uh, I think, is the second largest pension fund in Canada. So, of course, that when I'm facing with other IT consultant like me, I need to sell myself, you know, okay, if, if you think that I'm wrong, but uh, look, my mentor are, you know, the head of Huawei machine learning department and the head of Google DeepMind in uh, Montreal. You cannot discredit me for what I do, right? So, um, you know, to push away the, the harassment, I always have to, you know, uh, very bold, always in fun, um, like always know what I'm talking about, uh, always stay ahead of them, uh, of the game so that I don't, so that people don't look down on me. And uh, before I leave to, before I left Montreal for Cayman and one of the IT consultants came to me and said, Lynn, men, men look at you, they thought that you're like, um, gentle and stuff but when they talk to you they are terrified of you <laughs> and they take that as a compliment i'm like oh wow that's good they better be <laughs> uh yeah so so i guess as a woman is uh we have a disadvantage but we also have an advantage because women are perfectionists when we want to deliver a product we always push it into perfection so uh and then we also very good at um influencing people we know where to get what we want what we need to to achieve what we need to deliver um, yeah so I think that is a advantage of being a woman and about pay range I, I always make sure that I'm the top pay analyst in my company or in Cayman Islands <laughs> because I know what I can offer uh, you know and and I mean um, I don't keep all that money for me I invest it in myself to get coaching mentorship um, go back to school and bring all that knowledge because technology, it changed every month. And how, how can I make sure that my company always get the best? I always want to deliver the best solution, but uh, you know, I, I, I want my price for it, so. Uh, it. Very, yeah. very inspirational. And as you talk about the importance of um, mentoring and coaching, what advice would you give to uh, younger women who are, are choosing their career or, and who are considering technology or women who are thinking of switching into technology? 
Um, well, today I, I think we have a lot of advantage, like we have Datacom, Coursera, AWS is giving data science certification for free. If you want to learn about cloud technology, Google Cloud Platform is uh, giving cloud on Coursera, and if you sign up for a certain timing, you got like $300 credit to use a cloud pr platform. You have ton and ton of example available online. Um, what I would suggest is, to other women is follow your passion. If your passion is, you know, building website, uh, building a, a machine in C++ or in data science, whatever your passion is, there's plenty of online class that you go, uh, that you can go and take experience about it. Also, there's a lot of uh, a professional on LinkedIn that you can reach out to and ask them for their advice. In my case, I, I go to make you University now make you is offering online classes and they have uh, a website with all uh, with all type of tutor for any kind of language. So every time if I you know if I get uh, hit my plateau in Python, I don't know what to do. Um, I always go and reach out to all the experts that I know on on LinkedIn at make you University and. You know, I, I should have an open conversation with them. Hey, I'm looking for a tutor. Would you like to be my tutor? You know, and then when they show their interest, they tell me the rate, and then you know, um, if we mutually agree, then we, we just work everything over online, which is really, uh, really uh, convenient. And also, since I came from the IT consultant world, um, I know you know hundred of programmer like me, but in different areas. So uh, let's say tomorrow I need to do like a, a quick code in JavaScript. I can always call them up. Hey, can you tutor me this PC? you know, of, of code, I, I need that specific code. Um, I, I can have it easily. So I, I think I'm quite advantaged, uh, you know, by by having a large network of coder that helping me or I sometimes I, I can help other people for free if they need my help, you know, so. That's great. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and <laughs> uh, the expertise that you have as well. Um, Daria, uh, what uh, is your perspective on uh, the uh, um, younger women who are considering their career in technology at the moment? Is there any advice you would like to give them? Just persevere. Um, if you like it, then just stay with it and also realize that the imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> and everyone has it, like, and especially women in the field have it so much. Um, so just remember when you ask a question and some guy gives you an answer and he just talked for loops, it's because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if he knew the answer, it would be a straightforward answer and you would just get what you were looking for, not like, you know, sent for 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 a goose chase, a wild goose chase, basically. Um, but yeah, it's just it takes it takes confidence, but it's it's worth it. It's a very good field to be in. I mean, in these times right now, of you know, the coronavirus and all that, like. This job is is invaluable. It's great to have. And, you know, you can work anywhere in the world. You're not limited to to just, you know, where, like, for example, in Canada, in Alberta, there's oil or, you know, now oil's going down. Now everyone's panicking. It's you can you can move around different industries. You can do lots and lots of things. So there's lots of options in, in IT, but just persevere if you enjoy it. Thank you, Daria. And Holly, I'd like to go to you for the closing remarks and for the closing advice on the women looking at the career in technology. Well, I would probably say, going back to what Darla said, when she went into university, one of the first things she looked at was just being able to type. So I think starting at the elementary basics, getting people onto keyboards, getting people into some basic programming, I think there's some terrific STEM uh, programs and, and different community activities that are involved. I think you start as early as possible with getting girls involved in science. And that could be all kinds of different areas of science, not just computer engineering. So I think if we start at that very young level, that's where our biggest hope is to really get women involved in technology. And technology is growing and we're going to be seeing it moving through all the industries as all the ladies here today have said. I mean, we see it in finance, we see it in industry, we see it in medicine. So I think having that love for technology is the first 
challenge that we all need to instill on the next generation of young women. And um, again, I just hope that we can all do it together. And it'll be it'll be the next challenges. Hopefully, we'll get through this coronavirus. I have to agree again with Dara. I think we're very lucky to be in this industry so that we can move around and we're not restricted to the physical world around us. So I think with that, you know, we have to really, you know, appreciate what we have and hopefully pass it on. Thank you, Polly, and thank you, Lean. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, ladies, for all the insights today. And then, Caitlin, over to you now. This Tech Talks event was originally scheduled to be held at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. Due to present circumstances and to keep our community safe, we've moved the discussion online, but wanted to touch base with Natalie Urquhart and Maya Matu, who are using technology to make the national collection and current exhibitions as accessible as possible. So Natalie, thank you for joining us. Um, tell us about the current temporary exhibition and how we can take a look online. So Island of Women actually opened in late February, so just really before we started very rapidly needing to transition online um, and got a great opening night, lots of um, great content. And of course, we had a very large program built around it that we were looking forward to rolling out. So really had to think quite quickly about how to adapt. Obviously, we're looking at all the resources in the National Gallery right now about how to present um, easy to download or easy to access resources for schools and families um, at this point, which we'll speak more about um, in the conversation. But we were very fortunate uh, to have received a grant about a year ago that is specifically for recording our temporary exhibitions as virtual tours. This is obviously pretty new to the National Gallery. It's a, it's a technology grant. Uh, from an international foundation called the Phil Foundation, and uh, it's really been making a great difference. We uh, sought the grant because obviously we have a lot of community in the sister islands which don't get to come to Grand Cayman and to our exhibitions in person um, very often. So really that was what um, underpinned uh, the core of this um, project, but of course now it's serving us in, uh, in many more ways than we anticipated. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Maya, tell us about the online resources that are available for parents and educators. Yeah, so as Natalie said, it was really vital to us that we maintain the commitment that we have to the community and providing educational resources to go along with all of these amazing virtual tours that we're now putting up. We also have the collection online as well. Um, so there's a lot of information out there. And for us, it was it was important that we find a way to digitize the education programs that we have going as well. Back over to you, Natalie. Um, what do you see like around the world, what galleries and museums are doing? Are you seeing any trends about how they're using technology? That's a great question. And we are keeping very close tabs on that because, of course, as you know, we are not the tech people at the National Gallery. We're learning as we're going. And fortunately, with things like Zoom and social media, it's, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, and we're trying and testing all sorts of things. And a lot of those ideas, of course, are coming from other major museums that have great digital departments. They may already have a really good online teaching presence. Um, we're seeing a lot of virtual tours happening. And we're, of course, that's something else that we're sharing to our own platforms is we're not creating all of the content, although we do want a lot of it to be local Caymanian uh, cultural resources. But if there's other great content out there that is transferable for different types of um, schooling, again, Maya mentioned the curriculum, then we really are just forwarding those links. So there's been some great stuff happening at MoMA. Um, there's a great um, digital museum resource called um, Cuseum uh, that are posting on a weekly basis different types of digital engagement, how best to do that um, for education resources or membership and audience engagement. So I think um, one of the exciting things about um, being kind of forced into this moment is that our team are all learning as well and we're having quite a lot of fun doing it um, and we're cognizant at the same time that you know people have different um, sort of access points to technology so making sure that the community maybe has some printed resources and, and is able to pick up some art materials as well if they're limited um, i think one of the most exciting things for us so far is that you know our, our virtual tours are actually being recognized 
and picked up internationally um, along with people like the Louvre and MoMA and the Tate. And, um, and that's pretty cool. It shows you that even as a small museum in this digital realm, you can make quite a big impact. Um, so that was, uh, that was quite uplifting for everyone that's been working hard to make sure that we're getting these resources online in a really timely manner. Excellent. And what can individuals do right now to support the National Gallery? Great question. Um, I think we're just really keen that um, we try and share these links as much as possible. You know, there's no admission to the gallery and there's no costs involved in downloading any of these great education resources that are being created. There's no cost of going on the virtual tour. So it's free uh, material that supports any kind and any level of learning, whether you're an adult looking for some creative um, pastime from home or whether you're a school student that's uh, tasked with doing a lesson um, on geography that, again, might have been adapted in the National Collection. So we're just asking everybody to help us get these links out there to all of the members of our community that need them. So I think, again, just supporting your wider arts community. Obviously, we're all struggling at this at this moment, but creativity has to continue and it's what inspires all of us. So supporting your artists, um, sharing their posts, getting them getting them out there, reminding people that people are working really hard to continue creating and also documenting this story. Um, but yes, please share all of these links. Um, we want them to get out there and make a difference. Excellent. Well, thank you both for joining us today. It's great to see you. And um, for all, everybody who's tuning in, make sure to stop by the National Gallery's website to check it all out. And we look forward to meeting again. We'll speak soon. Thanks.